Hi friends! I know I'm a little late today with the Ivan story. I'm sorry. Um, I am excited to pick up where we left off. Remember, um, Ivan's paintings are finally being added to the billboard, right? But we're still trying to figure out if his message to save Ruby is going to be successful. We are very close to the end of our story. I'm so excited and I apologize. My voice is a little scratchy. My allergies have been bad. So bear with me. Let me turn off the sound on my phone. I was texting with the first grade teachers and sometimes we get a lot of texts going. So I don't want those interrupting our story. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, bum, bum, check marks. A tall man with a clipboard and a pencil comes to visit. He says he is here to inspect the property. He doesn't say much more, but he makes many check marks on his paper. He looks at my floor. Check. He examines Ruby's hay. Check. He eyes our water bowl. Check. Mac watches him, scowling. Bob is outside, hiding near the dumpster. He does not want to be a check mark. Do you think those are good check marks or bad check marks? Or who do you think this guy could be? Free Ruby. Every day there are more protesters and cameras with bright lights. Sometimes the people carrying signs shout, Free Ruby! Free Ruby! Ivan? Ruby asks, Why are those people yelling my name? Aren't they mad at me? They're mad, I say, but not at you. A week later, the inspecting man comes back with a friend. A woman with smart, dark eyes like my mother's. She has a white coat on and she smells like lobelia blossoms. Her hair is thick and brown, the color of rotten branch teeming with luscious ants. Ivan's descriptive language is so funny. I guess because he's a gorilla, right? She watches me for a long time, then she watches Ruby. She talks to the man. They both talk to Mac. The man gives Mac a sheet of paper. Mac covers his face. He goes into his office and slams the door. Sounds like we have some professional people coming to check out the living environment right now, right? Just like there are people that check on um, animals in um, pounds and stuff to make sure they're being taken care of. Or the same way someone comes to check on a job, right? The way Mr. O'Hare might come to check on me teaching, he might have a clipboard and some check marks. You gotta, there has to be someone making sure everything's going the right way, whether it's with animals or people, right? But it doesn't sound like this is going the right way. All right, I'll stop talking. New box. Something strange is happening. The white-coated woman is back with other humans. They place a large box in the center of the ring. It's ruby-sized. I suddenly know why the woman and suddenly, I know why the woman is here. She's here to take Ruby away. Oh, oh, let me show you the picture. Sorry. You might recognize on the box, it's got that giraffe. That's the giraffe. Remember that um, Ivan's been drawing on his paintings, and it represents the zoo, right, where he wants Ruby to go. Training. The woman leads Ruby to the box. She places an apple inside. Good girl, Ruby. She says kindly, don't be afraid. Ruby inspects the box with her trunk. The woman makes a clicking sound with a little piece of metal she's holding in her hand. She gives Ruby a carrot. Each time Ruby touches the box, she clicks and gets a treat. Why is she making that clicking noise? I ask Bob. They do that to dogs all the time, Bob says. I can tell he doesn't approve. It's called clicker training. They want Ruby to associate the noise with the treat. When she does something they want, they make that noise. Great job, Ruby, the woman says. You're a quick study. After many clicks and carrots, she takes Ruby back to her cage. Why is that lady giving me carrots when I touch the box? Ruby asks me. I think she wants you to go inside, I explain. But there's nothing inside, Ruby says, except for an apple. Inside that box, I say, is the way out. Ruby tilts her head. I don't get it. See the picture of the red giraffe on the box? I think the lady is from the zoo, Ruby. I think she's getting ready to take you there. I wait for Ruby to trumpet with joy. But instead, she just stares at the box in silence. 
I'm not sure you understand. That box might be taking you to a place where there are other elephants, I say. A place with more room and humans who care about you. But even as I say the words, I remember with a shudder the last box I was in. I don't want a zoo, Ruby says. I want you and Bob and Julia. This is my home. No, Ruby, I say. This is your prison. Think of how tough that must be. Ruby's a little baby, right? And she's grown used to Ivan and Bob and Julia and her home. And even if it's not the best for her, it's all she knows, right? And that can be scary. Poking and prodding. The lady comes again. She brings an animal doctor with an awful smell and a dangerous looking bag. He spends an hour with Ruby, pro poking and prodding. He looks at her eyes, her feet, her trunk. When he's, when he's done with Ruby, he enters my cage. I wish I could hide under not tag like Bob. Instead, I do a nice, loud chest beat, and after a moment, the doctor retreats. We're going to need to put this one under, he says. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I strut around my cage, feeling victorious anyway. I don't know if he should feel so victorious about that. If you don't know what it means to put an animal under to take care of or to check on them, it just means to give them medicine so they fall asleep. They do that with a lot of big, dangerous animals in the zoo to take care of them. No painting. No one asks for me to paint today. No one asks for Ruby to perform. There are no shows. No visitors unless you count the protesters. Max stays in his office all day. So it sounds like people are refusing to visit the mall to see the animals, right? So um, there's no shows for them to perform. More boxes. I wake up from a long morning nap. Bob is on my belly, but he isn't asleep. He's watching the ring, where four men are placing a large metal box. It's me-sized. What's that? I ask, still blurry from sleep. Bob nuzzles my chin, and I believe that box is for you, my friend. I'm not sure what he means. Me? They brought in a bunch of boxes while you were sleeping. Looks to me like they're taking a whole lot of you, he asked, casually looking at Paul. Even Thelma. Taking? I repeat, taking us where? <clears throat> well, some to the zoo, probably. Others to an animal shelter where humans will try to find them homes. Bob shakes in himself. So I guess all must th good things must come to an end, huh? His voice is bright, but his eyes are far away and sad. I'm going to miss your stomach, big guy. Bob shuts his eyes. He makes an odd noise in his throat. But what about you, I ask. I can't tell if Bob's just pretending to sleep, but he doesn't answer. I gaze at the huge shadowy box, and suddenly I understand how Ruby feels. I don't want to go in that box. The last time I was in a box, my sister died. All right, I, I don't like leaving us on a sad thought like that, but I have to get to a virtual meeting with the other first grade teachers, but there's something I want you to think about. Bob is acting like it's no big deal, like, well, nice knowing you, Ivan, see you later. Do you think he might be joking because he's afraid to show how sad he is? It's the only life he's known too, right? So there are going to be happy endings, I promise you. But why don't you make some predictions about where you think Ivan and Ruby are going, what you think is going to happen to Bob and Julia and George and even Max. So be thinking of those things, and we will pick back up on Monday. Bye, guys. Have an awesome weekend. I miss you.